vibrant, emergent Christianity is reaching out to the youth movement through flashy gimmickry and Disney-type entertainment. Successful Christian extravaganzas are attracting increasing thousands to so-called Christian concerts, awakenings, and gatherings such as the Passion 2012, when a packed stadium received mass induction into Eastern-style meditation, led by evangelical Christian leaders, and was packaged as biblical Christianity. In 1886, a student movement was founded called the Student Volunteer Movement for Foreign Missions. It became the official missionary arm for the YMCA and its female counterpart, the YWCA, which began in London, England, two years earlier in 1844. The Y's aim at its formation was for the purpose of improving the spiritual condition of young men and to put Christian principles into practice. Today, Y's are no longer focused in Bible-based missionary work. Interestingly, in the summer of 1888, when the volunteer movement adopted its official name, it took as its slogan or watchword, the evangelization of the world in this generation. The same term and concept revived in 1974 by the Lucerne Committee for World Evangelization. The idea of the current youth movement is to actually build the kingdom of God on earth. This is not about evangelism. This is about taking territory, taking steps, actually going out on the mission field and claiming territories of the earth for God, for global dominion. And so instead of this modern youth movement being trained in how to present the gospel of salvation, one-on-one, they are trained in something called the gospel of the kingdom, which is how to build the kingdom of God here on earth. In order to advance the mission outreach put forward in 1974 at the Lucerne Committee for World Evangelization, an organization was formed called the World Christian Movement. Its purpose is to put into effect systems for Christianizing nations. World Christians are those in the churches concerned with the social well-being of mankind as much as or more than their spiritual well-being. The World Christian Movement is a network of organizations that use the same resources and include the same buzzwords to carry out world evangelization. Its hub is the U.S. Center for World Mission, founded by the late Ralph Winter, a Christian missionary who Time magazine named one of America's 25 most influential evangelicals. The center is headquartered in Pasadena, California, and has regional offices in cities across the United States and sister centers in over 50 countries. All work towards mobilization for the world Christian movement. For their training, there is a study guide called Perspectives on the World Christian Movement, which is the primary source about the organization's mission philosophy. The manual disseminates what's called practical wisdom, enabling Christians to labor together in seeing that Christ is named and followed among all the peoples of the earth. It's a subtle but serious shift in the mission movement encouraging Christians to come in the name of Jesus Christ, giving a Christian credibility, but it's changing Christianity's biblical purpose with new worldly directives. Rick Warren and other Christian leaders who advance missions give allegiance to the name of Jesus Christ, but are driven by other mission plans and purposes. On November 1st, 2003, I announced that Saddleback would begin testing a new revolution and a new reformation in missions. The plan would actually be a return to the old way of missions, the way Jesus did missions 2,000 years ago. We would follow his plan and we would do it his way. You see, what Jesus told and showed his disciples to do is the solution to the five biggest problems on our planet. 
I call them the global Goliaths, the giants that are so big they affect billions of people, not just millions. And what are those global giants? Number one is spiritual emptiness. Billions of people do not have Christ in their lives. They don't realize there's a purpose for their life, that they're made to last forever, that their life is not an accident. The second biggest problem on the planet is self-serving leadership. And because we don't have leaders who are unselfishly serving, we have a lot of other problems, namely three more. The third giant is poverty. Half of the world lives on less than $2 a day, and over one billion people live on less than $1 a day. We have to do something about this. Jesus cared about the poor. The fourth giant problem are pandemic diseases. Yellow fever, typhus, malaria, AIDS, waterborne eye diseases. The number one killer of children is diarrhea. 30,000 children die every single day from preventable diseases. And the fifth global giant is a lack of education and illiteracy. Half of the world cannot read or write. How do we help people like that? Well, we do it the way Jesus did. Jesus Christ brought liberating news that he is the new covenant and told his disciples he'd make them followers of him, not church programs. Youth specialties would, uh, would promote themselves as a Christian organization uh, and, of course, right in the title. Youth, it's their specialty, it's what they do. They put on uh, regional events, they get a lot of speakers to come in, they get a lot of bands to come in, they do a lot of things that we would consider relational. It's one of their favorite words. We've got to find a way to engage the youth. And they do a very good job of marketing, there's no question. Their website is written in such a way that it, it's how kids talk to one another. They find the, uh, the people who speak to the concerns that they see as important, uh, one of the, the people that you'll find is a, a guy named Tony Campolo, seen as a Christian author. He's written tons of books. He's still one of the big movers and shakers in the movement uh, of the emergent church. He's one who believes that we need to build the kingdom of God, a kingdom now type of a theory that uh, until the world is evangelized and brought into a place of oneness, we can't move forward and Jesus can't come back because the world needs to come into a place of peace and oneness. There's one theme that's all the way through the Gospels. It's all about the kingdom of God, which is a new social order. Dress it up any way you want. Like Isaiah in the 65th chapter of Isaiah. Uh, in, in that chapter, starting at the 17th verse, he says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. No more will children die in infancy. Old people will live out their lives in health and well-being. Everyone will have a decent house to live in. No one will be homeless. It says everybody will have a good job and, and everybody will get fair pay. Uh, the environment, it says, neither shall they hurt the earth anymore. In terms of theological doctrine, there's not much doctrine there. There is a description of a new kind of world that God wants to create. Mm. And when he teaches his disciples to pray, he says, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done where? On earth. On earth. Please get that emphasis, on earth. Jesus came to start a revolution mm. that would end poverty, oppression, discrimination. Thy kingdom come on earth. In short, in case you didn't get it, guys, this is what it's about. It's about the kingdom. What we're seeing today in the emergent church is their idea of the gospel is that uh, Jesus said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so that is the true gospel. Brian McLaren in his book, The Secret Message of Jesus, says that for the last 2,000 years, the church has completely misunderstood Jesus Christ and that the true gospel of Jesus Christ is that the kingdom is now present among us and that the church's mission is to basically uh, create a, uh, a utopian society here in, in, in this world, in the here and now, that we are to be about combating social injustice, uh, all of the social ills in the world, uh, and that we will transform this world and bring the kingdom of heaven to this world. Brian McLaren says Jesus was the one who started this mission, and now we as the church are the ones who are to carry on this mission of creating a, basically a paradise here on earth. Youth specialties call themselves a Christian organization, but look at who they promote. Look at the things that are written on their website. Could any person come to that place and read enough to know to make a decision that would change their eternity for Jesus Christ. Youth specialties missed the mark 
on being a Christian organization. And the people that uh, run youth specialties have embraced the contemplative worldview, the idea of learning from the Roman Catholic mystical tradition and the Eastern Gnostic tradition, which goes back centuries and can be traced back to a group called the Desert Fathers. And youth specialties promote the contemplative worldview on a wide basis. In the wilderness areas of the Middle East, there lived Desert Fathers in small, isolated communities for the purpose of devoting their lives completely to God without distractions. Today's contemplative movement that is making inroads through the church, through emerging spirituality, traces its roots back to these ascetic monks who promoted mantra recitation, the repeating of a single word or phrase as a prayer tool to reach God. Contemplative mystic meditation is similar to that found in Hindu and Buddhist traditions, which can also be traced to Greek and Roman Gnosticism. Many Christians practicing contemplative spirituality rationalize their use of it as legitimate prayer, saying if their intent is to reach Jesus and their desire is sincere, then automatically the mystical vehicle must be acceptable to God. But this reasoning isn't based on the Bible's teaching that warns God does not accept pagan practice contaminated by unholy spirits that the Bible teaches are fallen spirits, also called demons. Sadly, many Christian youth movements involved in world missionary outreaches are being exposed to the unbiblical use of contemplative spirituality. Youth with a Mission is one of the primary groups in which the Dominionist teachings came through and actually were implemented. They were incorporated all over the world. The head of Youth with a Mission during those key years is a man named Lauren Cunningham. Lauren Cunningham now claims to have had a joint vision along with Bill Bright, who ran Campus Crusade for Christ, in which they saw that the Lord was telling them that they needed to build the seven mountains here on earth. They needed to build these seven spheres and take control of these seven areas of culture. And that's what they call the gospel of the kingdom kingdom, or in the mission world, they often refer to it as the cultural mandate. The seven pillars of any society where it is believed that culture can be won or lost are business, government, media, arts and entertainment, education, the family, and religion. Well-respected leaders Bill Bright and Lauren Cunningham were convinced that in order to impact any nation for Jesus Christ, these seven spheres would have to be affected. Bill Bright spent a considerable amount of time with a woman named Henrietta Mears, who had actually been highly influenced by John Dewey, the humanist education philosopher. Henrietta Mears had something called forest home briefings, and at these briefings, she actually taught and gave these men, some of which are major leaders in the evangelical movement, impartations. And these impartations was a laying on of hands, a transferring of spiritual gifts. This is a teaching we find in the Latter Rain movement, but we don't find it in scripture. Latter Rain teaching promotes the same ideas of dominionism and kingdom now theology that Jesus Christ cannot return to earth unless and until the church subdues and rules in various earthly spheres. Latter Rain is an influence within Pentecostalism and most branches of the charismatic movement with emphasis on extra biblical revelation, personal prophecies, and experiences that are placed higher than the authority of God's scripture. The Bible is interpreted in a symbolic and extremely stylized manner. Latter Rain doctrine seen in today's New Apostolic Reformation teaches gifts of the Spirit are passed through the laying on of hands or other visual means and commands. 
able to conjure spirits into existence and bring about certain man-made outcomes. This occult technique of impartation is also found in Hinduism's teaching of Shaktipat, meaning initiation to receive supernatural powers. It teaches with the laying on of hands or touching the third eye area, the guru or enlightened master, believed to be a conduit, transmits power for an awakening or enhancement of kundalini. Kundalini is serpent wisdom or snake power transferred to the initiate at the impartation, giving euphoric experiences. This method is not found in the Bible, but is an unbiblical technique used by many Christians. According to scripture, the Holy Spirit comes as He will when God wills in order to accomplish God's purposes and doesn't guarantee to respond to certain man-made appeals. Heresy teaches people have power to make spirits subject to them. Any such power is fraught with dangers and is not from the Holy Spirit, but from unholy spirits the Bible calls demons. Bill and Vonette Bright spent many years living with Henrietta Mears. She had a gospel message that was based on an extreme amount of pragmatism and what I would call simply humanistic psychology based on her background. But she also believed that the earth needed to be taken with the gospel, that the Great Commission actually literally had to be fulfilled, that we had to go reach every single people group and tribe in the world, and only then could Jesus come. So a number of evangelical leaders, such as Bill Bright, actually set the year A.D. 2000 as their deadline, as their goal. In fact, the entire evangelical mission movement was working on, let's get the Great Commission out to every single nation by the year 2000. The problem is they redefined what it meant to fulfill the Great Commission, and it became a mandate that became connected with the Dominionist mandate. It became a way of going out and actually changing nations and cultures, and somewhere along the line, the gospel of salvation message was dropped. Christianity for the last 2,000 years has been at the forefront of combating uh, human evils around the world, whether you're talking about racism, slavery, uh, inequality amongst gender, whatever it is. Uh, the Christian church has always been at the forefront of combating these social ills. But is this really the core message of Jesus Christ? Uh, was this what Jesus Christ was uh, really about? Did he tell his disciples uh, to go out into the world and open up a bunch of homeless shelters and soup kitchens? I, I don't think that that was the key teaching that Jesus Christ was trying to promote. What Jesus Christ said was he said, go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. Now the disciples went about the process of communicating the true gospel, which is, again, the idea that human, human beings are inherently sinful. We need a Savior who is Jesus Christ. They communicated that truth very clearly to us through the Gospels in the New Testament. And the disciples understood because they had lived with the Master for three years of his earthly ministry and were taught every day by uh, God in human flesh uh, what the true gospel was. Emphasis on sound discipleship was the heart of the ministry of Jesus Christ, who commissioned the church to do likewise. Being faithful to the accuracy of the true gospel and teaching the full counsel of God are vital to healthy Christianity. Distortion of scripture and doctrines has created division, misunderstanding and heresy in various Christian denominations and movements for 2,000 years. Since the birth of the church, the attack on the authority of God's word has been relentless. In fact, that was Satan's battle plan in the Garden of Eden in his conversation with Eve. Hath God really said? Satan's tactic has to sow doubt, question God's intention, and present an alternative that's been part of his seduction ever since and seen in some of today's heretical teachings and corrupt Bible translations. 
Understandably, apostasy increases through growing numbers of Bible translations and new paraphrases published annually. The message written by Eugene Peterson literally changes in some instances the meaning of the Word of God. Pro-gay and feminist revisions endorse homosexuality and lesbianism within the church. There's the Muslim-friendly version that changes the Trinity to make the Bible less offensive to Islam, which believes their God, not three persons of a Trinity, is called Allah, who actually represents the moon God given homage in the crescent moon atop mosques. His prophet is Muhammad, who they claim is a type of Messiah. An Arabic translation of the Gospel of Matthew changes the text from baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to the Muslim sensitive version, cleanse them by water in the name of Allah, his Messiah and his Holy Spirit. There's also a politically correct green Bible furthering environment care. In 2010, the Bible came out called the Green Bible and it had a number of contributors that were members of the religious left, including Brian McLaren of the Emergent Church a Movement, uh, Desmond Tutu, it had other leaders prominent in the religious left endorse it, uh, write it, the purpose of the Green Bible. And, you know, nothing wrong with a Bible that's going to highlight verses in green that apply to the earth, but they take this to a degree that is totally unbalanced. The paper and the cover must be ecologically friendly. Churches are encouraged to order this book and put it in their pews. And the emphasis of the Green Bible and its promotion is always the environment, not the gospel. You will not hear them promoting the gospel ever. You will hear them promoting the verses that have to do with creation, that have to do with protecting the environment. Environment care is part of the Eastern worldview of evolution. It teaches there is no creator and that life forms just evolved through chaos and mutations. That everything develops into higher states like the ape to the ape man to humankind and will eventually evolve into God consciousness through meditative altered states of consciousness like yoga that earthly and cosmic conditions will evolve into betterment and progress through human management in religion, economy, politics, etc. The Bible states otherwise, that all will become worse and worse before Jesus Christ returns. The environmental movement is another system that attempts to usher in the goals of Kingdom Now Dominionism. It claims man is able to control the laws of nature, change the climate, and maintain sustainability for earthly utopia. This pagan idea of tapping into the spiritual world to gain power has taken root in evangelical Christianity and is attempting to promote itself through an environmentally correct green Bible. I don't believe any known evangelical contributed to the Green Bible. This, once again, is based on science that is unprovable. This whole environmental issue has turned into a religion, the religion of Mother Earth. The roots of this is socialism and it is neo-Marxism. This is the perfect instrument to introduce socialism into the culture and eventually the church. In 2006, 86 evangelical Christian leaders, including Pastor Rick Warren of Saddleback Mega Church, based in Southern California, backed a major political initiative called Evangelical Climate Initiative to fight against the so-called problem of global warming and other earth care issues, which neo-evangelicals from the liberal left claim human beings are causing. Neither global warming or that human beings are causing it are problems that science has settled. 
But the socialist neo-Marxist agenda is urgently forwarding this propaganda with claims that unless curtailed, will take the lives of millions of our poorest global neighbors around the world. This initiative calls for federal legislation to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, which will cost several billions of dollars. The Evangelical Climate Initiative, at a cost of several hundreds of thousands, supported by the Pew Charitable Trusts, promoted TV and radio spots in states with influential legislators, organized information campaigns in churches, and education events at Christian colleges. The TV spots even linked Hurricane Katrina and drought and starvation to global warming. The Evangelical Climate Initiative of 2006 was financially backed by a couple of organizations called the Hewlett Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation. We find they are pro-abortion. They are for cutting the population. So we have the blending here of very well-known evangelicals uniting with some of the religious left, funded by outfits that are dedicated to globalism, socialism, Marxism, cutting the population, and promoting abortion. It takes multi-millions worth of dollars to get the promotion, to get the global attention, um, in order to uh, make a point that climate is out of control. <laughs> it isn't out of control, and it never has been out of control, and it never will be out of control. Uh, the Bible does not talk about such things, but the Bible talks about the earth is polluted because of one thing, sin. Only one thing will cure it, not the green Bible, a green agenda. The Lord Jesus returned. He is coming back to make the earth perfect and to rule and reign out of Jerusalem. And only that is going to help the planet. I say evangelicalism took a wrong turn somewhere, even though it took decades to take that turn. It's made a solid turn to the left some couple of decades ago, and now every year it morphs into something that represents more and more and more of the religious left. Evangelicals are not only being drawn into spiritually corrupt political agendas, but sadly, evangelicalism is also morphing in a paranormal sense. In the book, Have Heart, Bridging the Gulf Between Heaven and Earth, the Christian authors, an evangelical pastor and his wife, write of the sad loss of their son in a car accident. Through the first two thirds of the book, they cite numerous Bible verses and appear like sound doctrine writers. However, they claim the spirit of their dead son is routinely showing up in the church, interacting with the family and members of the church. Pastor Berger assures his readers that this has nothing to do with seances or mediumship, but is God lifting the veil between heaven and earth as a favor to grieving friends and relatives. The New Age has always advocated contact with the dead or familiar spirits, and so has Roman Catholicism through Vatican-blessed dead saints who appear as apparitions of sanctified saints. In the case of the Burgers, what they promote is spontaneous necromancy, meaning that they didn't conjure their dead son, but he appeared spontaneously as a presence and talked to them and others. There's absolutely no scriptural support of this kind of encounter. In fact, the Bible warns against lying signs and wonders in the last days. This book has the potential to cause grieving people actually to go to mediums. And by the way, mediums present themselves as Christian intuitives rather than psychic occult channels. More and more evangelical Christians and leaders are becoming complacent and careless in opening up their followers to dangers 
that come with tampering with the occult or supernatural world. Rick Warren, in his 2011 Daniel Plan, through the appeal of promoting good health to his worldwide congregation of numerous thousands, introduced occult pagan practices and promoters of some seriously dark facets of Eastern mysticism. John Piper, who is a prominent pastor of Reformed theology, and most Reformed theology people stand for Calvinism, amillennialism, replacement theology, the Church is Israel, these types of issues. John Piper leads a conference known as Desiring God. He has many hundreds and hundreds of pastors who follow him. And he chose to take his Desiring God pastors in April of 2011 to Rick Warren's Saddleback Church. But in January of 2011, Rick Warren really stepped over a line by featuring three occultists in his pulpit, Drs. Amen, Oz, and Hyman. And the signal that is being sent to the evangelical world that these three doctors are safe, that we can receive health counsel from them safely, is most troubling because they are occultists. They are new age slash occultists. So it was devastating to many within evangelicalism to see one of the, well, one of the leaders within the movement, John Piper, signal to the church, the occultism at Saddleback Church doesn't bother him. All throughout the New Testament, uh, we're, we're warned to be on alert uh, that, that there was going to be uh, false teaching would appear uh, from outside of the church and also from within the church. I'm not going to say that those New Testament authors had the leadership of the emergent church in mind when they wrote those particular warnings to the church, but I would say that uh, this is just one more example of some of these end times uh, deceptions that the Bible warned us to be on alert for. Anytime we see any movement, whether from within the church or outside of the church, which is not proclaiming the true gospel of Jesus Christ, which is not promoting true biblical Christianity, we need to be very concerned about that. And Christians who uh, are trained in a biblical worldview need to, uh, number one, recognize those errors, uh, confront those errors, and then help other people to uh, discern truth from error. I just am very, very concerned about the collapse of evangelicalism as I have known it for several decades. I have been working in churches or in ministry for 35 years. I have seen a transformation in those years, and the transformation isn't a good one. The transformation is one of grumbling. It's one of compromise. I think that the church is suffering from overwhelming ignorance of sound teaching. The Global Leadership Summits, hosted by Pastor Bill Hybels of Willow Creek Community Church in Illinois, are yet more examples of Christian leadership promoting eclectic paganism, interreligious meetings, and interdenominational cooperation. The Bible warns destruction comes through entering the wide gate and Heibel's annual gatherings certainly encourage a wide Christianity. Willow Creek is seen as a sort of a marker within evangelicalism. Um, it has many, many churches in its stream under Pastor uh, Bill Heibel. Uh, once a year in the summer, he has a conference where he brings in celebrities and as, as I get many of these they're unsaved people they're they're not church people uh, Jimmy Carter uh, Bono I mean there just have been numbers of participants in this so-called leadership conference how have these unbelievers actually helped Christian leadership I in the 21st century Best-selling author of over 20 books, Hybels is known worldwide as an expert in equipping and training Christian leaders to transform individuals and their communities through the local church. 
thousands of young churchgoers attend Heibel's events to learn about leadership from guest speakers from diverse religious backgrounds who are influenced by New Age mysticism, eclectic spirituality, they may be sympathizers of Hinduism, Buddhism, contemplative meditation, and there are speakers who are Roman Catholics. Heibel celebrities promote psychological techniques, motivational self-improvement procedures, business management skills, and religiously left agendas, as seen in Heibel's wife, Lynn, who partners with social justice and world peace endeavors and anti-Semitic luminaries who oppose Jewish presence in Israel. Lynn Heibels is extremely outspoken. She writes for Jim Wallace for Sojourners, the magazine. Jim Wallace is a Marxist from the 1960s who's now a very prominent socialist. And Lynn Heibels is influencing millions of Christians across the world. And she has taken a very pro-Palestinian position. I've seen her writings. She is standing against God's people, the apple of God's eye. She's speaking against the nation of Israel and the Jewish people in favor of uh, the Palestinian people. The sad truth is the very heart of evangelicalism is being stabbed when Christians betray Israel. Hundreds of thousands of Christians are being misled at these conferences which teach feel-good experiences and seem to be on the cutting edge of Christianity. But biblical Christianity is being neutralized and the purity of God's fundamental narrowness is being forced to open widely. Proverbs teaches, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Evangelicals such as the Hybels and others can't see, because of their theology, Israel's rightful place and her rightful deserving of the land that God gave them. Not only did he give them the land they're on, he gave them exceedingly more land. The religious left don't even want Israel to have the land that she has, land the size of New Jersey. The topic of Israel is problematic in dominionist circles because this is where there's a lot of division still. All of the various dominionist streams have still not come together on the whole Israel uh, issue because some of them say that Israel has no business being in the promised land and they should not exist. Other dominionists believe that Israel is key and very important because they believe they're building the kingdom of God here on earth and they need a place for the king to return. I fear that the nation of Israel is being used by dominionist leaders to further their own political ambitions, which is global in scope. And they see Israel as key to their goal of taking over the world. Jesus gave promises to Abraham for um, a land, a seed, and a worldwide blessing. As true believers, we are grafted into these promises by being included in Christ. And so if Jesus has given promises to the Jews, he will be faithful to keep his promises to us. Replacement theology believes erroneously that the church extends back in time all the way to Adam. Therefore, the church, this church, is said to have been populated in the Old Testament by the Jews the problem is the word church never appeared in the Old Testament. The church was born at Pentecost, and it was the nation of Israel, not the church, who received the law and the promises made to Abraham. This teaching that the Gentile church has replaced the Israeli church is a false teaching that really comes from allegorizing the Bible rather than taking the Bible literally. Dismissing a literal interpretation of scripture, as many churches teach today, sets up a different missions mandate than the one Jesus commissioned to his followers. He said to make disciples, teach sound doctrine, and be involved in spreading his good news across the globe. Many in today's growing apostate church disregard Jesus' mandate, instead promoting Augustinian allegory. 
Augustine was a leading church father who developed Roman Catholic theology, which has since influenced most of Western Christianity. Augustine applied symbolism to his theology, which created great rifts of division. Those in the original church believed in the fundamentalism of scripture as literal, but those adopting Roman Catholicism approached scripture as allegory. For instance, the promises of God that were to be literally applied for the coming of a literal nation of Israel were said to apply presently to the Roman Catholic Church. Also, that the earth was the literal kingdom of God when Jesus taught that his kingdom is not of this world. The Bible is supposed to be the foundation for everything that we believe. It's the only way of knowing truth. Foundationally, if we don't and can't rely upon the Bible, then it's going to give rise to all kinds of odd doctrines and belief of end times. And it's what's given rise to, uh, to much of the, the bad teaching that is in the church. Uh, bad eschatology gives rise to very bad doctrine. We can't have skewed theology about the last days. We're, we're in the midst of them. The Lord's return is imminent. Tomorrow, we don't know. It's certainly not thousands of years away. How convenient for the devil, for the enemy, to start putting a spotlight on end-time theologies that are so skewed that uh, we think that the tribulation took place in 70 AD. The so-called Bible answer man, Hank Hanegra, who wrote a somewhat popular fiction series on preterism, which says that all Bible prophecy happened in 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem, that Nero was the Antichrist, that the tribulation was the persecution of the saints, and that a, a full preterist would say Christ returned in 70 AD in spirit. A partial preterist would say that Christ's return is yet future, but they would rule out all the other elements from a literal tribulation, even a literal rapture. To understand the times, you've got to understand how are they going to end, the Bible says. There is a literal antichrist coming. There is a literal tribulation come. There is a literal battle of Armageddon. There is a literal millennium. And this kind of theology is known as premillennial dispensationalism. If we don't have the Lord's return, what do we have to look forward to? Nothing. If we don't have the hope of eternity to focus on many, many times a day, what do we have to look forward to? Absolutely nothing. Bible prophecy throughout the scriptures is extremely significant because it lays out for us in advance things that God wants us to know. The Bible is the only book that has ever been written where statements made regarding the future we can consider to be 100% accurate. There are many prophecies which have already been fulfilled. There are other prophecies that are in the process of being fulfilled and there are others that will be fulfilled. That's why it is so important when we look at prophecy with regards to the last days that we pay attention. One of the most basic principles that the Bible lays out is that there is a, an element of time that God deals with mankind. Adam and Eve was the beginning of mankind. That had a beginning. It ends with the revelation of Jesus coming back as the conquering Lord. And in the interval of that time, God deals with mankind in a variety of ways. He dealt with Abraham by faith. He dealt with the children of Israel and Moses by the law. Now he deals with us in this time by Jesus and, and his intervention at the cross, his blood atoning for mankind's sin, not just for us here in this time, but his blood atones for all who ever died in faith. There is an ending to all things. The traditional teaching of scripture is that Jesus will come back at a predefined time. Much of the church nowadays doesn't believe that, nor does it teach it. If we believe that Jesus could come back at any moment, it's gonna change the way that we engage this world. But if you believe that Jesus can't come back to the earth until we fix everything down here, you can get very involved in the things of this world. But if you believe that Jesus could come back at any minute, it'll absolutely revolutionize the way that you engage the culture and the world around you. God has not left us to our own devices. He's given us his word, his instructions. And within the Bible, we have prophecy. He not only told us how to live our lives, 
but he has told us what is ahead for us. When Jesus came, the Jews had an agenda. They were expecting a Messiah who would remove the oppression that the Roman government had placed on Israel. And Jesus is going to do that, but he came first as the suffering servant. He came first as the Lamb of God to take away sin. So consequently, he's going to return, and he will rule from Jerusalem. Nevertheless, we see men with their own ideas avoiding Scripture or turning from Scripture to their own concepts and their ideas. Uh, we, right now, today, uh, there's a mentality within the church to solve and fix all the problems of the world, that we're going to turn this world into a paradise. And Jesus cannot return until we have squared it away. We have solved all of its problems. This is a major movement and has been a movement in, in the modern church. How does it fit with Scripture? It doesn't. Jesus will return. He will set up his kingdom. But we are not going to solve the problems of this world. The rapture will take place. Jesus will catch up to himself believers in him. They will go to heaven. Uh, during that time, there will be seven years of tribulation on the earth. Many who have an agenda avoid all these things, but these are the clear teachings of Scripture. This is what will take place. Yet trying to solve the problems, fix the world, and many Christians don't realize that they're actually going to be helping the Antichrist develop his, his kingdom. One of the things that's important for people to understand is that Jesus said that the poor would always be with us. Okay, that's a clear teaching from God in human flesh. And Jesus also said that this world wasn't going to get progressively better and better. Instead, Jesus said that as the end drew near, you would hear of wars and rumors of war. You would see famines and earthquakes and natural disasters. And, and so what we need to understand is that we need to have a, a prophetic view of what is taking place in our world. We need to understand that we are not on the brink of a social uh, global revolution transforming this world into a utopian society. What we need to understand is that Jesus clearly told us that the end was coming. And that as the end drew near, we would see more and more chaos, confusion, catastrophe in our world. And this is why as Christians, regardless of what kind of ministry you're involved in, we need to keep the gospel at the forefront, which is the eternal heart condition of men and women. Whether you're working with AIDS patients, whether you're feeding the hungry, whether you're working in homeless shelters, uh, you know, all of the good works in the world will not do anything to change the human heart condition, which is men and women's need for a savior. And so if we fail to proclaim the gospel, the hard truth of it is, is without a clear proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, all we're doing is simply making this world a better place to go to hell from. That's really what it boils down to. We need to clearly communicate the need to come to Jesus Christ as your Lord and savior. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life.
I hope you found Volume 2 helpful in understanding the problems and pitfalls of the new emerging Christianity. And I invite you to watch out for Volume 3 coming soon from Carol Productions, which will explore the new apostolic reformation, the signs and wonders movement, Christian Palestinianism, and more. For further information on these and other subjects to help you discern the times in which we live, as well as for additional resources, including books, DVDs, and my autobiography, Out of India, please visit www.carrilltv.com. Thank you very much.